showed us here, Brother Alfred Sorensen Little. I'm Bishop Paul Thielon. I'll be presiding and conducting this meeting. On behalf of the uh, family, we would like to thank you for your prayers and your uh, thoughts and over these uh, last few weeks of even uh, dealing with the loss of their father and husband and grandfather. We will, uh, in the, before we came into this meeting, we had the family prayer that was given by Suzanne Theobald, the daughter. We also have at this meeting conducting uh, or the prelude music and post of music is by Brother Steve Allen of the Battle Creek Third Ward. Our chorister today will be Michael Little, a grandson. And we'd like to uh, go ahead and move forward with our program with the opening hymn, Our Firm Foundation, verses 1, 3, 4, and 7, after which our opening prayer will be given by Geneva Mark A. Dillon.
grateful for his example of patience and love. And love of God and love of his neighbor. And how he passed that love on to all of us and helped us to all feel how much not only he loved us, but how much thou lovest all of us, and that we are all thy children, and that thou lovest each and every one of us. We are grateful for the memories we have with him, for all the good that he has done in our lives, for his discipleship, and for just the wonderful example of us, kind father and husband that he was. We pray that will bless all of us as we continue to mourn, that we will be comforted and strengthened, uplifted, and that we will feel his presence in our lives. And we know that his influence can still be felt. And we pray for thy spirit to be with us this day. And we say these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. Program of Lord's Falls with your, uh, and you've been handed out. The live sketch will be given by Nathan Little, son, after which we'll have a musical number by all the grandchildren and great grandchildren uh, of the song Gethsemane, accompanied by Amelia Wilkin, granddaughter, after which we'll then hear from Rebecca Smith, the daughter, and have another musical number by the adult children and grandchildren. Eternal Father, Righteous God. The original hymn was written by Alfred S. Little, and it will be accompanied by Georgia Bales, granddaughter, after which we'll then hear from David the Little, the son, and we'll go to that point in the program. My father's parents, Wallace Jorgensen Little and Alvarette, Elizabeth Sorensen were both born in Hiram, Utah. Wallace's mother and Alpharette's father were both first-generation immigrants from Norway. Wallace's parents separated at eight years old and he was raised by his single mother. Alpharette's father died when she was less than a year old and her mother remarried when she was 11 years old to a farmer in Paradise, Utah. After they married in 1931, they lived in highway construction camps where Wallace worked as a civil engineer building highways in U.S. national parks. Alfred's older siblings were born near Mount Latson National Park and in Yosemite Valley. By the time Alfred was born, they had purchased a home in Alameda, California, southwest of the city of Oakland across the bay from San Francisco. Alfred Sorensen Little was born August 19, 1938. He was three years old when Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese in 1941, thrusting the U.S. into war and casting a shadow over much of his early childhood. His father, Wallace, was not medically eligible for the armed forces, but he was sent to Canada to improve the Alaska-Canada Highway. From a dirt road that was quickly carved by the Army Corps of Engineers to a two-lane highway. Mom and children moved in early 1942 to be with family in Hiram, Utah, away from the West Coast and possible Japanese bombing raids. They moved back to Oakland in 1943, where young Alfie, as he was known, began his schooling after his father returned a year and a half later. In 1945, they moved to Sacramento, and in 1946, they moved to a house in nearby rural Carmichael on about two acres of land where they could keep a cow, chickens, a pig, and raise the family in more stable circumstances. At 11 years old, he was given a crystal set by a mentor named Burge Dixon, who also later served as his scoutmaster. He was amazed by the ability to listen to a radio broadcast without any apparent power source and his curiosity was further fueled by a one-tube radio, which despite the name has three tubes, uh, also gifted by Brother Dixon. Alfred studied radio circuit design and became quite competent. 
in the subject. He harvested a radio from a 38 Dodge Coupe that his older brother had procured and, and was trying to rebuild. And with the power supply, also again donated by Brother Dixon, he was able to rebuild the radio in a new chassis with very good sound quality for the time. Alfred also <laughs> nurtured a love of music, beginning violin lessons at seven years old and piano lessons at age 12. During a trip to General Conference in the Tabernacle, he heard the organ and the choir and took an interest in that instrument as well, which would later become his favorite. Alfred enjoyed scouting. Though he was prevented from rank advancement by a fear of water, he served as a junior assistant scoutmaster in his later teen years. As an explorer scout, he participated in a navigation training course at nearby Mather Air Force Base, which influenced him in his decision to join the Air Force ROTC when he started at BYU. In 1956, his father moved the family across the country to Arlington, Virginia, where his father took his final assignment with the Bureau of Public Roads in Washington, D.C. before retiring in 1962. On the way across the country, Alfred was dropped off at BYU, where he would ultimately choose to study physics rather than electrical engineering as previously planned. This was motivated primarily by a desire to save time and money. He was conscious of the financial support that came from his father, and physics required only four years, whereas electrical engineering would require five. In 1958, he paused his education to serve his church in the Mexican mission. Formal language training was not available then. So um, the term of service was two and a half years, providing an additional six months to learn the language. When Alfred returned home to Virginia in April of 1961, he quickly met Joanne Stevens, who at the time was only 16 years old. <laughs> After a lengthy courtship, he married the love of his life on June 13, 1963, in the Logan Temple. Um, if you try to do the math, that's a week shy of her 19th birthday. So she was of age. <laughs> uh, Alfred had completed his degree and received a commission as a lieutenant with the U.S. Air Force. He was required to report to his first assignment with the 6594. Aerospace Test Wing at the Satellite Test Center in Sunnyvale, California at the end of the month. During his four years of service, he supported spy satellites that took pictures of various Russian and Chinese military sites during the Cold War. The details of those programs, codenamed Gambit 1 and Gambit 3, were highly classified at the time, and he wouldn't give the family information, but much information has been made public since then, um, and is freely available through a web search. Um, Part of his work for the Air Force required him to create test programs for the software that was provided by government contractors. It became clear that the success of those programs depended on the quality of that software um, because the sites that they wanted to take photos of, they weren't in a straight line, in a straight orbit, so um, the missions, which typically lasted three days, would have a, a satellite launched into orbit and rockets firing to change the trajectory of the orbit um, as necessary. So, um, because the programs depended on the quality of software, in 1967, at the end of his commission with the Air Force, he left and took a job with the primary contractor for his program, TLW where he worked for most of the re his remaining career. During his Air Force service, his first two children were born, and after leaving the service with a higher civilian salary, he could afford to buy a home. He and Joanne moved to a new two-story, five-bedroom home at 2686 Plaza Americas in San Jose, where they would welcome eight of the nine additional children that would join the family. During his Air Force service, his first two children, oh, sorry, I'm jumping backward. It, by 1969, Alfred was named the architect of ground software for the new Hexagon satellite system, and through the 70s, he managed a large department and oversaw many related programs. One proposal was awarded to a competing bidder, General Electric, but part of the software was still awarded to TRW. 
uh, requiring both companies to work closely together. To facilitate this, Alfred moved his family to Pennsylvania in the Philadelphia area where his youngest daughter, Geneva, was born, returning to California about a year later. A few years after returning to California, at the end of that assignment, his company opened an office of the Electromagnetic Systems Laboratory in Murray, Utah. The family moved to Pleasant Grove, Utah in 1981. Uh, among the projects he worked on there was a system that could prevent the illegal cloning of early analog cellular telephones. Um, this goes back to his love of radios and his uh, deep knowledge of them. They would basically take a fingerprint of the radio circuit from each phone that was broadcasting and they could tell if somebody was cloning because the fingerprint didn't match. Unfortunately, the program had about a 0.1% false positive rate and because the majority of their customers were very wealthy and needed access to their cell phones, they could not afford that uh, level of, of error and the program failed. But uh, among others, um, he did a lot of work with radios, one of his primary loves. Um, TRW made the decision to close the Murray office in 1988, and the family again returned to San Jose, California, where Alfred would work for several more years before he was offered an early retirement from incentive from TRW, and took another job with Lockheed Martin as the Oracle database architect for the Millstar satellite program. Alfred also gave many years of church service, including in Bishop Ricks in San Jose. Uh, upon his return from Pennsylvania, he was called as the stake executive secretary and given the assignment of preparing the necessary paperwork for the approval of a stake center to be built for the San Jose East Stake on the corner of Crockley and Morrill. He also spent many years contributing to the scouting program. He served as a district commissioner, and um, in that service, he was often bridging the gap between church-sponsored units and um, non-church-sponsored units, which had different philosophies in, in how scouting should be um, run. In 2004, Alfred retired from Lockheed Martin, and he and Joanne moved back to Pleasant Grove, Utah, where they could be close to the majority of their children and grandchildren. He continued to serve the Boy Scouts of America, and he and Joanne were both aboard the Silver Beaver. He spent considerable, considerable time working on family history, with significant work in his later years focused on his Norwegian ancestors, whose records had become more readily available. In June of 2023, Alfred and Joanne celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. On August 12, 2024, Alfred passed from this life surrounded by his wife and children. In Provo, Utah, after a mercifully short battle with cancer. I know that I couldn't do justice to the many details of his life and his love for the church, but I know that he felt that his service in the church and his work as a parent were those things that were dearest to his heart and the most important to him. Of all the accomplishments, those were the greatest. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning. That song that they just sang happens to be my most favorite song about the Savior. I was holding it together so well before they closed that casket and those children sang. I appreciate Nathan's um, life sketch that covers so many good details about my dad's life. I feel a little better about the fact that my remarks don't have nearly that level of detail. Um, I hope to focus on what I feel like my dad's, some of his greatest strengths were, and how that played out in his life and in his example to us. When I think of my father, um, I feel like there was two, two motivations that, that ran and, and moved in his life. And the first one was his love of his Father in Heaven and his Savior. And the second was his love of other people. Um, and along with those two motives, I think, some of the attributes that he had, the unique gifts that he had that allowed him to live out that, that life in love was, um, and he had so many good attributes, but the three I thought of were his integrity and his sensitivity and his wisdom. And all of those things circle back to his love of the Savior and the Lord and and how he showed that love through loving others. Um, his father, Wallace Little, also was very much a man of integrity, and I believe that my father saw that, and um, that he, he very much came with that gift, but also embraced that gift as he grew up in his home. He lived by the old adage that, and this is a little segment of integrity, if a job is worth doing, it's worth doing right. Um, whether it's a designing a new sprinkler system, or building raising, raise, raised plant beds, or installing sod, or finishing the basement, uh, my father would create the blueprint, and then he'd gather his children to execute that plan. And in a very similar way, he was extremely loyal and true to his testimony of the gospel and living and, and helping his children to live a life that was in keeping with church standards. Um, I appreciate that uh, my mom, oh, sorry, I have a little thing to share about this integrity with church standards. When I was a sixth grader at Valley View Elementary um, years ago, we had a little camp out that was scheduled for the summer after our sixth grade year. And I know that it was something that we all looked forward to greatly. But all of my friends were very excited. And when it came time to tell our teacher if we were going to go to that camp out, I had to go and say, no, I'm not, because my dad feels that this camp out isn't in keeping with church standards. And it's because we had boys and girls in the same campground. Um, and he just, he felt very strongly about that. And of course, my little 11 year old heart was so sad. Um, but what he did to show his love for me in that moment was he, he chose to drive me down to Clear Creek Camp Out, which is kind of heading down to San Pete County. And so this is about a two hour drive from our home in Pleasant Grove. And he drove me down in the morning and allowed me to participate in all of those activities during the day. And then he picked me up at night to drive me to my grandpa's house in Manti so that I could sleep at grandpa's and so that we could be true to our standards. And he did that for both of those days. And 
I don't think I recognized at the time what a, what a beautiful expression of love that was for me. But that's who he was. Um, another thing that I really appreciate about my, my parents is that um, both of them are very highly sensitive people. And many of their children that they gave birth to were very highly sensitive people. And this is something that they never treated that as a liability or a character flaw. They always treated our sensitivity as a strength and an asset. And um, I really appreciated that because it, and they lived out their lives with great sensitivity. And it allowed them to be the vehicle of loving others. Um, he always brought his love of people to the table along with his meticulous, de detailed grasp of information. He could educate himself on virtually any issue and then turn around and translate that knowledge into useful counsel and effective teaching of te others who needed him. He had the gift of wisdom. You know, we have that whole summary of all of this the amazing intellect that my father had, but that stuff never really was, was visible for me as his daughter. What I saw from my father was a man who loved. And yes, I knew he was also really smart. Um, many of my siblings can tell you that um, often when we had a very simple question about any topic that didn't need a very big answer, a homework question or really anything, Number one, dad would never say, no, I don't have time. He would sit down and talk with us. But number two, it sometimes turned into a very long-winded lecture <laughs> about the history and the, you know, the trajectory of all of the, the knowledge and the philosophy underlying whatever our question was. Um, I think it was Andrew that told us that um, that quality, that long-winded quality my father had really motivated him to learn how to do his math homework by himself. <laughs> <laughs> and this was true for many of us. I mean, it just needed a little simple answer. It was, but he saw everything and he wanted to bless us with everything. And so I, you know, and in some ways, like, I didn't care for that so much when it was a homework question. But when it was a question, of, a difficult question about the church, or uh, a question about how to navigate some difficult situation in my life, I really appreciated his thorough love and attention and thoughtfulness that he helped me always to just think about all of the, all of the possibilities and the questions that most of us don't think to think, ask about. Um, as we navigate through difficult things. Um, as a teenager and a young adult, I had dear friends that would come over to our home in San Jose and visit, but more than once, what they, who they really wanted to talk to and visit with was my dad. And at times when, sometimes we would bring a boy home from a date, and instead of saying goodbye on the doorstep, we would somehow end up on the couch chatting with my dad. And they loved it, and I loved it. And um, if you ever had the privilege of just sitting in the living room, just visiting with my dad, you could just, you can feel that love that he had just, and he was never in a hurry oh, to say, oh, I need to get going, I need to do all of this. He just sat with you and just was there for you. Um, and, and he made you feel like the most important person in the world. When you were sitting in front of him and talking to him, you were his favorite person. All of, our, all of us as children felt that we were his favorite, and he made us feel that way. I know that he doesn't really have favorites, but I felt like it was me. Um, and, another, and another way that this love came through from him was when one of us kids and this is often also as a teenager, um, when I had a, a, a struggle that I was struggling with, uh, it was usually after, well after midnight, when I would find my way to my mom and dad's room and 
sit on their bed and say, Dad, Mom, are you awake? And they would, they would sit up, turn on the light sometimes, but sometimes they didn't, just sat up and listened and just let me talk. They never said, we're too tired, please go to bed. Um, and as a parent, I understand what a sacrifice that was now. I did not at the time. Sleep is precious. And you know what? They did not care. They, when your child needs to talk, you talk. And I just am so thankful. Those are some of my most tender times and memories that I have with both of them. And you can't talk about my father without talking about my mother. Because they just were so in sync and sometimes it was a little like they never fought and, and or if they disagreed they never did that in front of us um, and so we grew up not realizing that it was normal to have like disagreements as a couple and um, differences of opinion to work through because they just were so unified and together and I, I appreciate that example um, and also this love of my father came through when his children did just exceptionally stupid things and um, you know inevitably when there was a crisis that came up um, he would immediately deal with the crisis whatever it was and then he would when discipline was needed he would do that privately and that that way he treated us with dignity was such a blessing and it's a, so rare. He never talked down to anyone. He never treated anyone in a punitive way. Um, he would have been justified many times in expressing frustration and anger. Um, again, due to the supremely stupid things that 11 children can get into. Um, just one quick little experience, and I know that some of these, some of you have heard this little story before, but when I was a 15-year-old teenager, um, I had this brilliant idea that I wanted to go drive, did not have a license, had my permit, brand new permit, wanted to go drive some blockbuster videos back to the video store, and I was just determined to do it, and no one was going to stop me, and so there I went. And you know how California roads are. It was a very scary drive to that video store. And as I pulled into the parking lot, into the parking space, I promptly swiped the car next to me and left a little note on the car and left and came back home. And Kurt Jameson was on our doorstep waiting to take me to their home to babysit. And I panicked and I drove past my house and I thought, oh no, what am I gonna do? Brother Jameson's there. And so I did a little three-point turn and backed right into the bumper of a camper of our neighbor across the street. <laughs> and a neighbor that we did not know and just, I didn't do anything at that point except pull into the driveway and say, okay, Brother Jameson, I'm ready to go. And he said, oh, Rebecca, did you get your driver's license? And I said, yeah, I sure did. <laughs> and he said, well, good for you. And that's all he said. And we left. And uh, of course, within the hour, I had a phone call at the Jameson home. And my father said, Rebecca, what happened? And, but again, he never, he never um, humiliated us or embarrassed us in front of others. And he, it was Christmas time and he helped me to go and find the bumper to replace on that camper at a salvage place. And he, he helped me to go and pay the man whose car I swiped. Um, and it, it just, his love never failed. And that's just who he was. Um, I know I, I probably need to close, and I have many, many other things I could say. Um, I just want to thank Heavenly Father for the privilege that I had to have him be my dad. Um, 
we could talk for another hour about all of the people that my father and mother adopted and loved and, and made a part of our family. Um, we have three members of a little family that we brought had into our home for six months when we when John and I were babies. And that family has become very loved in our home. And I'm so thankful just to have seen that love in action um, through the years. And once my father and mother adopted you, you were family. You never left our family after that. And anyway, I just um, I just want to say thank you to Heavenly Father for blessing me to be be the, this amazing man's daughter. And I'm so thankful for his love, for his uh, ability to teach us the gospel and instill in us a love of God and a love of others. And um, I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
So as we were uh, dressing my dad in his temple clothes yesterday, uh, the last thing that we put on him were his shoes. And he's got big shoes. I remember as a child uh, walking around in his big shoes. They were, they were big. Um, my little feet were swimming in them. But none of us truly walk in another person's shoes. And there's only one who has walked this earth, who knows the battles that we fight and what we go through in this life day to day. And his name is Jesus Christ. Still, we can walk in someone's footsteps. Dad walked in Jesus' footsteps. He was truly a disciple of Jesus Christ. So let me share with you a few of the words um, that we have recorded of his testimony. From my Aunt Marilyn's funeral, he said this, I testify of the reality of life after death and the atonement of Jesus Christ that provides us the opportunity to become what our Heavenly Father intends us to be. As we do so, we have the promise of peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. So let me talk a little bit about peace in this world. Jesus said, in this world, ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And then he also said, come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So paraphrasing what I hear him saying is, you're going to have much trouble in this world, but don't let it get you down. I have overcome it, so yoke yourself to me, and we'll get through these troubles together. Dad had troubles in this life, and he yoked himself to Jesus Christ to get through them. Up to the very end, as he struggled with the quick decline of his body, he was learning what it meant to be yoked to the Savior. How did he do it? How do we do it? Elder David A. Bednar taught us how to do it. He said, we take the Savior's yoke upon us as we learn about, worthily receive, and honor sacred covenants and ordinances. We are bound securely to and with the Savior as we faithfully remember to do and do our best to live in accordance with the obligations we have accepted. And that bond with him is the source of spiritual strength in every season of our life. It starts with learning about Jesus Christ and then making covenants with him through baptism and then in the temple and weekly at the sacrament table. Dad made covenants in the temple and lived true to them and I'm grateful for his example to me. As I follow in Dad's footsteps, I'm following in Jesus' footsteps because Dad showed me how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let me share a few more words from you from his testimony. He, he bore his testimony at Grandpa Stephen's funeral. And he said this, As I lay in bed contemplating the happenings of the day, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me. I didn't see a vision or anything like that, but it was a real and solid experience where I felt the expression of love of the Lord Jesus Christ and his desire to bless this family, both as a family and as individuals and his desire to heal us. I believe that the healing spirit, the healing of the spirit, or the transformation of the spirit of a person is the greatest of all the miracles of Jesus. I testify of his love, the love of Heavenly Father, as well as of us, as a family, as individuals, and as children of God. And my testimony to you today is that Jesus Christ lives. The greatest desire of my heart is to come to know Him and to be like Him. I fall short every day, but His grace comes to me when I earnestly seek Him. Because I can change the nature of my heart with Him. And it's not easy and it's not fast, but as I look back on my life, I can see the progress that I've made. And I look forward with faith to be better. Now, belief in Jesus Christ is a choice. When I made that choice, the Holy Ghost spoke peace to my, to my heart, confirming that it was a good choice. 
And then as I made covenants with him and strive to live by his words, the peace, the love, and the healing that has come into my life is undeniable. When I hear people recite words of Jesus Christ from the scriptures, I feel the spirit in a way that I cannot deny. I testify that he came to earth and showed us the way back home. He took upon him the sins of the world. He suffered all things and bled from every pore. How many drops of blood were for me? All of them. In my heart, I know he would have suffered even if it was just for me just for you. Such is the nature of his love for me and for all. If I could pass on one thing to my children and to my grandchildren, it would be a love of the Savior. I want you to come to know him as I have, as Grandpa Lily has come to know him. And I know that Dad has the same desire for his children and grandchildren. And so I invite each of you to consider how embracing Jesus Christ might bring peace into your lives. I testify of the resurrection. I testify that families can be together and we will be with Dad again. For all who mourn, and especially for you, Mom, I leave with you the words of our prophet, Russell M. Nelson, from several years ago. He said, We mourn for those love and loss. Mourning is one of the deepest expressions of pure love. It is a natural response in complete accord with the divine commandment, Thou shalt live together in love, insomuch that thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die. We can't fully appreciate joyful reunions later without tearful separations now. The only way to take the sorrow out of death is to take the love out of life. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. some things here to do. First of all, the family would like to thank the Battle Creek Third Ward Relief Society for the uh, luncheon that we'll have after the service today. Also, they would like to thank you the Utah Valley Mortuary for their service and professionalism and helping them through this process. They would also like to thank the Military Honor Guard who will be at the cemetery to give their honor and tribute to Al Alfred for his service. We'll go ahead and name the pallbearers at this time. And uh, when, after my remarks are done, we'll get the closing prayer. We'll have the pallbearers go up in that foyer on my right. Uh, and then the, uh, we'll have the men in the mortuary come up and, and we'll have the family call them up. The pallbearers are Thomas Little, Lydia Theobald, Peter Markley, Robert Little, Christian Smith, Sadie Little, Joshua Little, Kayla Little, Logan Little, and the honorary pallbearers, pallbearers are James Little, Stephen Theobald, Joseph Little, Stephen Little, Michael Smith, Wade Markley, Andrew Little, David Little, John Little, and Nathan Little. After my closing remarks, and we'll sing hymn uh, 295, O oh, Love That Glorifies the Sun, after which our closing prayer will be given by Andrew Little, her son, and then interment will be at the Pleasant Grove City Cemetery, and the address is on the program. The grave dedication will be given by her son, Stephen Little, and uh, before he gives the dedication of the grave, we'll have the military honors from the U.S. Air Force performing there their respect. What uh, we've been well taught today, and I'm not going to go over a lot of the things that I've written down because I, I don't feel I feel impressed that uh, a lot of it's already been said and mentioned. But one of the things, that, a couple of things that came to my mind as we listened to the speakers today, um, Nathan brought up uh, Al Alfred's wisdom his education, his family, and the importance of those things in their life. Rebecca talked about in integrity. 
a man of principle, and she talked about that trip to clear, uh, be a camp up at Clear Creek. What it, what it was in that wasn't an also about her teaching of restitution and how that works with repentance one day. She had to go home and take care of the repairs that she caused in her time of dragging. Um, and of course, David taught as well about the Savior Jesus Christ, about how Alfred was yoked to the Savior Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, he was able to make those covenants and being yoked through him throughout his life. Behind every good man is a, is a great woman. I have eight brothers and one sister, and I understand how it is for a mother in a big family. And as great as Alfred is, you got a great mother, Joanne, because behind the scenes for the big family, the mothers, what keeps the moving house, of how the going of keeping the family together. And so Joanne, I want to uh, thank you for being a great daughter of God and a, and a good mother here on earth for your children and family and your great grandchildren and grandchildren. Because you uh, keep your family together. And I know Alfred was a, a great partner with you and you guys made a great team. But we know too that our Father in Heaven has other things for him at this time in his life. I want to uh, share something that Elder Russell M. Nelson said many years ago, which David talked a little bit about. And he used the doors of death. Some doors are heavier. He actually says, the real separation evokes pains of sorrow and shock among those left behind. The hurt is real, only as intensity varies. Some doors are heavier than others. The sense of tragedy may be related to age. Generally, the younger the victim, the greater the grief. Yet even when the elderly or infirm have been afforded merciful relief, their loved ones are rarely ready to go. The only length of life that seems to satisfy the longings of the human heart is life ever life everlasting. Irrespective of age, we mourn for those loved and lost. Mourning is one of the deepest expressions of pure love. The natural response in complete accord with the right command, thou shalt live together in love inasmuch as thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die. We have been blessed to have been taught our all today. And we've been, been taught throughout our lives by Alfred Swanson Little. What a great man, what a great son of God. And what a great example for his posterity, as we know. He now goes out to the other side to work with his posterity that he has so helped here going to the temple and doing a lot of work for his posterity. I know his church is true. I'm grateful for the little family. We're grateful for you that have come to support them and love them and, and mourn with them. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.
blessing that we have had. grateful during this time of mourning for the many angels that thou hast sent, both seen and unseen, to comfort and lift us up. Please help us to go with thy spirit. <coughs> 